All right, so layer one, the physical layer. So when we talk about our OSI model and we talk about the physical layer, we're talking about the actual transmission of bits over our network. And those bits in a computer are represented by ones and zeros. That's how everything in a computer sees it. It doesn't matter if it's an image or text, it all gets broken down to ones and zeros at the end of the day. Um, the physical layer is going to talk about the physical and electrical characteristics of the network. So how are our bits represented on the medium? Uh, what are the wiring standards for our connectors and our jacks? How is our physical topology laid out? Is it a star, a ring, a bus? How are we going to synchronize our bits for sending it? How are we going to utilize our bandwidth and how are we going to multiplex so we can get more information over the same media at the same time? So with our bits, we have to talk about how is it represented on the media that we're dealing with. So if we're dealing with copper, for instance, we're going to have that as an electrical voltage. If it's fiber optic, we're going to have it as a light, either an on or an off. So in the left-hand side here, you can see that we have a um, two different ways of doing it. One is called current state modulation, and one is called transition modulation. <clears throat> in current state modulation, if you have a zero volt, then zero is going to be represented. But if you have a positive or a negative five volts, then a one is represented. And you can see that as uh, shown in the graph here. So every time we have a zero voltage, we get a zero. Every time we get a positive five or a negative five, it's represented as a one. And same thing as we keep going through. On the other hand, with transition modulation, it looks at it based on when does the state change. And so here we have a zero volt, and it stayed at zero, so it stayed at a zero. Then it changed to a one to a positive five volts, so it became a one. It stayed at positive five, so it stayed at zero. Stayed at pos and then it switched down to negative five, so it became a one. And every time we change voltage, we get a one. And every time we stayed the same, we got a zero. Uh, <clears throat> So that's just a very big overview of how bits are represented in a copper wiring. Um, do you need to know that for the test specifically? No. Um, it's just good background information for you guys to understand. What you do need to know for the test, though, for certain, is the wiring standards. So if you don't have the color codes memorized yet, memorize them. <laughs> uh, so the TIA-EIA standard 568B, if we have B, which is shown here on the right side of the picture, on both ends of a cable, we call that a straight through cable. If we have an A and a B, that is going to be what we call a crossover cable. Straight through cables use B on both ends. Crossover uses an A on one side and a B on the other. Okay? Uh, we are going to talk more about these wiring standards when I get to the Ethernet module. Um, for now, just remember that B to B is straight through. A to B is a crossover. You will see test questions, um, possibly even a simulation, that asks you to build a cable. Okay? So they would give you the eight strands of wire, uh, which are referenced like we see here in the B standard, the orange, white, orange, green, white, blue, blue, white, green, uh, green, yeah, brown, white, brown, and you'll have to put them in the right order, pins one through eight. So memorizing that standard is very important, okay? Because if it's a simulation, remember, simulations are graded very harshly compared to multiple choice. Missing one simulation can really hurt you. Missing one multiple choice, you can get over, right? So make sure you understand that. Uh, physical topology. Layer 1 devices view the network from a physical perspective. They don't care about the logical portion of the network at this point. All we're dealing with is how our cables connected. So if I look at the cables and they're all one straight line, well that's a bus network, right? If it's a big circle, it's a ring. If they're all going back to a central switch, that's a star. They can also be a mesh or they can be a, a hub and spoke, right? Um, again, we, we talked about network topology earlier. Those are the, the five ways that we looked at it. But when we're dealing with layer one, we're all talking about the way it's physically cabled. We don't care about the logical portion at this point. And that brings us to synchronizing bits. So when I'm sending all this data over the wire, how do I make sure that both systems are receiving and sending at the same time? Well, there's two different ways that we can do it. One is called asynchronous mode, and one is called synchronous mode. With asynchronous mode, we're going to use what's called a start and stop bit to indicate when transmissions are ready to start from the sender and get to the receiver. Um, in synchronous mode, instead, we're going to use things synchronously, which is based off a time signature. So they're both going to use a reference clock and coordinate their transmissions. So with asynchronous, if you think about it like um, the old walkie-talkies you played with as a kid, right? You would say what you had to say, and then you'd say over, right? That said, hey, that's my stop bit. I'm done talking. Now you can talk, right? That's the idea of asynchronous. We have to tell it, I'm ready to start. Here's my message. OK, I stopped and that way the next guy can go. With synchronous, we don't have to do that. It's just like uh, when you come to class, right? You know that class is from 
starts at noon. And if you're sitting in your chair at noon, at noon the instructor should get up here and start talking. Um, we're all working out the same clock schedule. Whereas if we did asynchronous, if you ever do asynchronous learning online, they usually put up modules or discussion boards or something for you to do, and you can do it on your own time whenever you want. You don't have to be there at the same time as the instructor. With bandwidth usages, we have two different ways we categorize things. We have broadband and baseband. Okay? You guys have probably heard the term broadband before. Uh, it's used heavily in marketing by Xfinity and Comcast and Time Warner because they're cable TV providers. And so they say, hey, get broadband internet, right? As if that's going to mean that it's a faster internet than baseband, which doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily true. It's just the marketing that they've done. But what broadband does is it divides your bandwidth, your total available, into separate channels. The way I like to think about this is if you look at I-95, right? If we had no lines in there, it'd be one really big, one really big road, right? And we can get some really big trucks through that thing. But we separate it into four different lanes. And so everybody can share the one highway with the four different lanes. And depending on which lane you go in is how fast you're going to go. Uh, broadband, broadband does the same thing. So if you look at your cable TV, everything coming into that cable TV, all 300 channels, is coming into you at the same time. But as you tune your receiver, you pull out just the one channel out of that 300 that you want to watch at that time. That's how broadband works. You're using all of the, all of the bandwidth, it's being separated into multiple channels, and each of those channels can be pulled out and viewed at a, at a certain time. Okay? Um, and that's how cable TV operates for us. Baseband, on the other hand, it's going to use all of the frequency um, and transmit it at a reference clock so the transmissions are sent and received by the sender. So the way we do baseband, that's things like telephones and ethernet. So when we do our network traffic inside of our networks, generally we're using baseband. So if you have a cable, an, uh, a Cat5 cable going to your laptop, and you have 100 megabits per second, you're getting all 100 meg megabits per second. It's using the entire frequency available over that cable to do that. If you were using cable TV, on the other hand, you're going to get 300 channels. You have to choose the one channel you want to watch. So you guys see the difference between the, the broadband versus baseband? Baseband uses all of it. Base, uh, broadband only uses a single portion at a time. Yes? Yes, broadband, you're only pulling out that single channel at a time. Yeah. Uh, baseband, you're going to use the entire frequency available on that cable. So you're going to get all of it. So if you have something like baseband, and you want to be able to share that cable with other people and use multiple people on the same cable, you have to do a way of doing multiplexing, uh, which multiplexing is taking multiple signals and sending them over a single, uh, single thing. And there's three different ways that we can do this. One is called time division multiplexing. Okay? In this, everybody takes turns using different time slots. So, for instance, there's four of us in this class. Let's say that every second, I'm going to get the first quarter of a second, John gets the second quarter of a second, uh, Michelle gets the third quarter, and Jennifer gets the fourth quarter. And so as we're talking, we each take a quarter of a second, right? And if we physically could do this with our voices, it would sound like we were all getting to talk our full time, and nobody would notice the difference, right? Because you wouldn't, really wouldn't hear that quarter of a second subtraction, right? Um, and so what would end up happening is we're each taking a quarter of a second, so we're getting 25% of the total, right? And each of us get every second, we're getting 25% of it. And so that's time division. We each get our time slot. Another way to think about that is think about TV, right? TV has 24 hours in a day for, say, NBC, right? They divide that up into 30-minute chunks, and each show gets 30 minutes to play with, right? So they, you don't have just like, uh, I don't know, Survivor, right? Well, I guess it's a CBS show, but whatever. Uh, let's say you're going to watch Survivor, right? It's not 24-hour-a-day Survivor channel, right? It's, if you're going to watch Survivor, you need to t go into that particular time slot to listen to it. That's the idea of time division multiplexing. And so for us as senders and receivers, if we're both on the same sending and receiving time slot, I'm sending at the first quarter of a second, and John's receiving at the first quarter of a second, he'll always listen to my signal. And then he stops listening for the second quarter of a second, which is Michelle's turn. And so we each get a piece of the total bandwidth. Uh, and that allows us to get one cable used four different times. So as you can see here in this diagram, every person, the four different users that we're trying to get, are each getting a portion every 25% of a second, and over time they're going to get their whole message sent. Instead of that, we can also do what's called frequency division, which is the one here listed on the bottom of the screen, which is what we do with broadband. So back to that cable TV uh, signal, right? The medium is, the, is separate out into separate frequencies, and each channel 
gets their own frequency all of the time. So again, if we look at it from a TV channel perspective, NBC might be this top one, CBS would be the next one, the yellow one would be ABC, and the last one would be ESPN. They're all on all of the time, right? And when you want to listen to them, you tune to that particular station, and you're going to pull out just that one uh, band that you're looking for. Okay? That's different than the time slot idea, where it's 8 o'clock, you've got to figure out which show you're going to watch, because only from 8 to 8.30 is only this one show on this one channel. Okay. Um, the other way we can do this is what's called statistical time division multiplexing, which is a variation of the time division multiplexing. And essentially those time slots, instead of saying that I get every 0 to 0.25 seconds and John gets every 0.25 to 0.5 seconds, we have those very fixated quarter of a second intervals, we actually get variable based on the need. And the machines can de determine that based on statistical priority. For instance, in this class, I do a lot more talking than the rest of you, right? because I'm the instructor. And so I probably need more than a quarter of a second. If we're going to split this up, maybe I get 80% of the time, and the three of you guys will all split up the other 20% equally. That would make more sense, right? Um, that's what statistical time, time division multiplexing does. It looks at the past history of how much you've used and adjusts those time slots as needed so that the people who talk more get more time and the people who talk less get less time. Otherwise, when it comes to your quarter of a second and you're not saying anything, we just hear silence when I could have used that time to put out more messaging. And so that's the idea of multiplexing. Uh, the whole idea and concept of it is how do I get more information over a single uh, cable over a certain amount of time? Okay, so some examples of physical stuff. Physical stuff would be our cabling, our ethernet, and our fiber optic. Uh, it can also be radio frequency, our wireless, Wi-Fi, and our Bluetooth. As far as infrastructure devices, the things that operate in layer one, which means they are dumb devices. They make no decisions based on logical addressing or machine addressing or any of that stuff. Uh, you have hubs, because again, hubs all they do is whatever comes in, they repeat right back out. You have wireless access points. Those are dumb devices, okay? Everybody connects into the wireless access point. All it does is it converts the wireless signal to an ethernet signal and pushes it out the um, RJ45 jack. And you have media converters. And what a media converter does is it converts from one type of media to another. So for instance, let's say I was using a fiber optic network, okay? But my computer here only accepts copper cabling of RJ45. How do I get that fiber into an RJ45 jack? I use a device called a media converter. The fiber goes in, those light signals get transmitted into the copper signal and out to a, a, a Cat5 cabling for me to use, and vice versa. So that's what a media converter does. It converts from one media type to another, either wireless to Ethernet, Ethernet to fiber, fiber to you know, one type of fiber to another type of fiber. All those type of media converters exist. Um, the other device out there that you'll see is what's called a repeater, uh, which is in the old days, with, or even nowadays, with the RJ45 cabling, with uh, Cat5 cabling. You have that 100 meter limit. Let's say I had to make a 300 foot run, or that's probably a bad example, 300 meter run. What I would do is I would go about 90 meters, put a repeater, which would repeat the signal, boost up the signal, send it out another 100 meters. Then send another repeater and boost the signal and then send it out again. And you can keep doing that as much as you need to to make those long runs. Or I could switch to a medium that's not copper that would actually support a longer run. But if I need... The signal won't diminish because it's a powered repeater. It takes whatever it receives, boosts the signal back up, and then sends it out again. That's the whole purpose of having the repeater. And one of the things when you design your infrastructure, when we start putting switches in, in buildings, is you decide where those switches need to be because switches can act as a repeater for you. So every time you hit a switch or you hit a hub, uh, your signal gets reboosted and that 100 meters starts over again. And so that's one of the things you have to think about with your infrastructure to make sure you're not going over that physical limitation. So on the bottom... This? No. The top square. This? Under it. This. Okay. Sorry. What is this? Uh, that is a Jibic. Okay. And what that is, is it's a, a, if you want to think of it as a network card for a switch or a router, um, they're, they're made by Cisco. They plug in and you can actually pull them out. So for instance, if I have a Cisco 2800 and it came with four uh, RJ45 jacks, but I needed some fiber jacks, I can actually pull out the network jack and put in a fiber module and now I can have fiber. And so you can switch them out for different interfaces as you need because again they're physical 
all they're going to do is whatever comes in, they're going to switch it into the electrical signal to the chassis of the switch. Yep, sorry. And that's the same thing that this is. This is a single one. This is a dual one. And that is the physical layer.